Well, good morning. Good morning. It is a joy and a blessing to be here with you all this morning. I shared with the band earlier that the song Springtime was played before the first sermon I ever preached. So it's really beautiful to be here and to be reminded that the church is the church everywhere. Amen. Please hear the words of 1 John chapter 3, where we'll be this morning. I'm reading from the message translation today. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We are called children of God. That's who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously, because it has no idea who he is or what he's up to. But friends, that's exactly who we are, children of God, and that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him, and in seeing him, become like him. All of us who look forward to his coming stay ready with the glistening purity of Jesus' life as a model for our own. All who indulge in a sinful life are dangerously lawless, for sin is a major disruption of God's order. Surely you know that Christ showed up in order to get rid of sin. There is no sin in him. And sin is not a part of his program. No one who lives deeply in Christ makes a practice of sin. None of those who do practice sin have taken a good look at Christ. They've got him all backward. So... My dear children, don't let anyone divert you from the truth. It's the person who acts right, who is right, just as we see it lived out in our righteous Messiah. Would you pray with me? God, what a gift and a blessing to be reminded of who we are as your people today. Would the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, God? And would we, your people, leave this place more in love with you and with one another than when we came? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The first time Evan Duncan ever asked me to preach... Our college ministry was in the middle of a series on Leviticus. So he looked at me and said, you, brand new scared preacher, <laughs> you should preach on Leviticus, chapters 11 through 15. Now I know all of you spend your first hour of the morning reading Leviticus, and so I don't have to give you a recap. But for myself, I went back this week and just to see what all Leviticus 11 through 15 is about. Well, let me tell you, these five chapters in the Bible are all about skin disease and fungus and bodily fluid. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Thankfully, for you and for me, Evan did not ask me to preach on Leviticus today. Someone say amen. <laughs> Evan introduced us to the book of 1 John last week, where the people of God are trying to figure out how the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus impacts the church. What does it mean to be people who follow Jesus this side of Easter? What truths about Jesus do we need to hold on to? What lies have crept their way into our faith that we are tempted to believe? One question that arose for the church that we'll address this morning is, how does the life of Jesus impact our actions? How does the holiness and the perfection of God change who we are? How does our faith impact our acts of justice and mercy and compassion and grace and love? Have our actions become unwed from our faith? 
Or have we not taken our faith seriously enough that it actually impacts our actions? These were questions that the church in 1 John was wrestling with. Perhaps there are questions we ought to wrestle with today, too. So we just read 1 John 3, verse 1, and I'm thankful for the children who have learned that they are God's children. It tells us we are called the children of God. That is who we really are. We are part of God's family. Our actions, our attitudes, our habits can reflect that. But there's a word of warning here, too, for the church. It says the people have no idea what you're up to. They won't understand why you do the things that you do. And isn't that so true sometimes for our families? There are things that you and your family do that are a little weird to people outside your family. My grandfather, growing up, every time he would see me, he would give me this compliment. He would look at me and go, Hannah, you're just as cute as a black Angus heifer. <laughs> That's weird, right? None of you want to be called a black Angus heifer because I've just called you a cow. But you don't know my family. You don't know that my grandfather grew up as a rancher and that his job from the time he was a kid was to take care of these baby heifers, to nurture them, to care for them. He loved them. He thought they were cute. He thought they were fun. This was a term of endearment for him. And the family of God is the same way. We don't always do things that make sense to people. We are sitting in the middle of a building on a Sunday morning when we could be in bed to sing together and read from an old book. <laughs> That's a little weird sometimes to people who don't see it. <laughs> Church is weird. Why do we love certain people? Why do we provide meals for people who will never repay us? Why do we care about the immigrants or the single mother or the elderly shut-in? This week, I heard a story about some of you in this church who on Halloween set up a table outside and provided water and pretzels to people until 3 a.m. Who does that? Apparently, even some of the students that you were serving were confused and were like, can I like, pay you? I don't have anything to give you. It doesn't always make sense what we do. But that's what being part of the family of God means. I joked about preaching from Leviticus for my first sermon. And I'll give Evan some credit. <laughs> Maybe he knew what he was doing, I don't know. But that sermon changed my life for more reasons than one. Because it made me look deeply at scripture. It made me think deeply about why scripture says what it says. That when you look at one piece of it in context of like the larger whole, we start to notice things about it. When you zoom out on the whole book, whole of scripture comes alive. So although chapters 11 through 15 is full of weird laws and regulations and orders and instructions, we find that this book is actually a book that teaches us that God will stop at nothing to be in a right relationship with his people. It's a book that tells the people that their relationships with each other and with the earth and with their own bodies deeply matters in their relationship to God. And as the people begin to wrestle with what their relationship with God looks like, they are forced to also wrestle with what their relationship with everything else looks like, too. Their worship of God is deeply tied to their relationships and to their actions. The instructions people are given about fungus, about how to deal with bodily fluid, they're given 
so that the people will have to think about how the very things that they touch impact their relationship with God. At some point in time, we've all been brought into this family of God. And that means that our relationships deeply matter. That our worship is affected by our actions. Our actions reflect who our family is. I don't know what your relationship with your biological family looks like. I don't know if you have a good relationship with them, if you look like them or act like them or talk like them, but the good news is, is that this chosen family of God is chosen because God will stop at nothing to be in a right relationship with you. And even though it doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes, some of the things we do, in this family, our actions towards one another and towards the earth and towards ourselves, they matter deeply in our relationship to God. Our actions reflect who our family is. That's what it means to be part of the family of God. But it's not the only way our faith is impacted. Verses 2 and 3, we'll read again, friends, that's exactly who we are, children of God. But that's only the beginning. (laughs) Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him, and in seeing him, become like him. All of us who look forward to his coming stay ready. With the glistening purity of Jesus' life as a model for our own. See, our actions not only reflect who our family is, they also follow in the footsteps of Jesus. As verse 2 and 3 says, we take this glistening purity of Jesus' life as a model for our own. That word purity can be understood as righteous, whole, clean, without fault. That word is tied to a word we use a lot to refer to God, holy, to be whole, complete, not lacking in anything. In other words, you want to know what it looks like to perfectly live out your calling in the family of God? Look at Jesus. Our actions follow Jesus. So if our actions follow Jesus, what did Jesus do? In my previous position as a college minister, I started seeing a lot of my students come to church with these bracelets on that had the letters H-W-L-F on them. And I was like, what is this? And they said, oh, it's this movement that's happening. It's called He Would Love First. That's what it stands for. And it was grown out of this question in popular evangelical society of like, when we ask the question, what would Jesus do? The response was he would love first. And so they had these bracelets. He would love first. He would love first. And I I liked that initially because I thought, oh, we're taking this seriously. We're thinking through what Jesus would do. But the problem is, is I think this movement added one too many words. I don't think that it's just that Jesus would love first. I think it's that Jesus would love, period. When Jesus looks at the world, when he looks at you and I, he responds with love, always. It's his only response, not just his first one. You want to know what Jesus does? He loves Sometimes in ways that it doesn't make sense. Throughout scripture, we see that Jesus breaks social norms and barriers to sit with a Samaritan woman. He eats at homes of people considered sinners. He feeds people who are hungry. He admonishes the wealthy in society. He criticizes religious leaders who use their authority to oppress and manipulate people. He turns over tables of religious people who deny outsiders access to God. 
He was radically inclusive of oppressed and marginalized and the overlooked people in society, no matter what anyone said about it. That's who Jesus is. He loves, period. Theologian Henry Nouwen describes following Jesus like this. He says, following Jesus means to let go of the I and move toward the other. Following Jesus means to dare to move out of ourselves and to slowly let go of building ourself up. We pursue justice and kindness, not because it makes us feel good about ourselves or because it's like the politically correct thing to do sometimes, but because following in the footsteps of Jesus will always move our focus farther from ourselves and more and more onto others. How are our actions connected to our faith? How does the holiness of God impact our life? In every possible way. Because when we belong to the family of God, our actions and our relationships matter more. And the most perfect example of that is Jesus, who constantly moved away from building up his own reputation, his own status, and moved toward others. Jesus loves, period, without exception. Maybe we should too. Our actions reflect who our family is. Our actions follow Jesus, but our actions also reveal something about who we are. Verses 4 and 7 4 through 7 we'll look at again. All who indulge in a sinful life are dangerously lawless, for sin is a major disruption of God's order. A major disruption of God's order. It talks about sin as a dangerous lawlessness that disrupts the order. Throughout Scripture, we get glimpses of what God's order is the new way of life that God is creating. One of the most prominent examples we see of this is actually in the book of Revelation. (laughs) This passage casts a beautiful image for where we're going, for the life that God is establishing on earth through us. It says this, Revelation 21, verses three through five, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. That is God's order. That is the dream that God is inviting us to live into. It's a picture of what the kingdom of God looks like without pain or death or mourning or crying. A place where God and people and creation live together in peace. They dwell together. In the same way that our actions can reflect who our family is. And in the same way we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus, our actions can also reveal a lack of investment into the kingdom of God. (laughs) When we choose to cause pain, neglect, harm, when we fail to live together as the people of God, to dwell with each other, then we fail to live in this new order that God is creating. 
our actions reveal what we're invested in. Are we invested in the kingdom of God? Are we living in light of this new order, this new dream that God has called us into? How might each of us this week take time to invest more deeply, more fully into the new order, the new life God invites us into? Are there relationships that need mending? People you need to talk to, forgiveness that needs to happen, people that we've hurt or neglected or overlooked, how might this week each of us take time to live more fully into this dream God invites us into? Verse 7 says, it's the person who acts right, who is right. Life in the kingdom of God is seen through our actions. Back in the summer of 2019, I spent some time in Washington, D.C. For the summer, I was there and I worked for a church. And I got to know the music minister pretty well. But pretty quickly, I realized that he's, he wore the same outfits quite a bit. <laughs> like, pretty much the same five outfits always. And I was like, what is the deal with that? I asked him about it, and this is what he told me. He said, Hannah, nearly two million tons of textile waste end up in the landfill each year. That's about 81.5 pounds per person per year. And a majority of our textile industry participates in the abuse, exploitation, and neglect of garment workers, and they rely on unethical business practices to grow their businesses. And this really bothers him. And so he says, rather than contribute to what he considers to be this very real injustice against the environment and against humanity, he limits his textile consumption and only buys from places that he knows are ethical, sustainable, and fair trade brands. Who he chooses to send his money to and the clothes he puts on his back is a direct response to his convictions. What if we lived our lives like that? What if our actions matched our convictions? What if our faith is not just about what we feel in our heads and in our hearts, but what we do with our hands? Our actions reveal what we're invested in. We've been welcomed into this beautiful family of God and like some that have come before us, even all the way back to 1 John, sometimes we don't always know what that means. Sometimes we don't always know what to act because of that. But thankfully for the church then and thankfully for us now, we've been given encouragement and instruction for how our faith deeply impacts our lives. We don't just do acts of justice and compassion and grace because it makes us feel good. And we don't do it when it's convenient or because it's the popular thing to do. No, our actions are informed by the family of God we are a part of, by the example that Jesus has set for us and the new reality of this kingdom that we embrace. <coughs> Our actions reflect who our family is. Our actions follow Jesus, and our actions reveal what we're invested in. When I was in middle school, my family decided to change schools, so I started going to a private Christian school. <laughs> and I thought this was going to be a great time, because, like, I love church. I'm a big old nerd. <laughs> 
I thought it was great. I thought it was gonna be a grand time. And I showed up to middle school and found out pretty quickly that was not the case. That somehow it didn't matter that the kids I was in school with also said they were Christians and went to church. They didn't always treat me very well. They didn't always treat my friends very well. And almost from day one, I started to feel this sense of frustration. Because these people who would say all the right things in Sunday school on Sunday morning did all the wrong things the other six days of the week. <laughs> and they would make fun of and neglect and bully people that I cared about. You've met people like that. The ones who believe in God's grace but show none of it to others. Who have felt the love of God for themselves but try and hoard it and don't share it. The ones who sing songs and read scripture every week about God's justice and righteousness and peace and yet choose to do nothing about the injustice that we experience in our own communities. We've heard about these Christians. We've met these Christians. We've certainly seen these Christians on social media. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I've been one of those Christians. But it doesn't have to be this way. We have been given a new family, a new example and a new kingdom order. And that changes everything. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hey, I'm Evan Duncan, the senior pastor of the Baptist Church of Westchester, and I'm so glad you found us on YouTube. I just want to thank you for engaging with us. If, if there is more you want to know about our church, about ways to connect, or, or even if you want to support the work of God in our community, you can visit bcwc.org. That's also how you can connect with us. As you go, I want to share with you a blessing, a benediction that comes out of this book, A Common Prayer, A Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you in the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace and be the church.